the script to introduce you to folks behind the mic that you want to know. I'm Darren Otto and I'm here with my good friend right here. Now if she looks familiar to you, probably a good reason why, especially if you're a country music fan. So let's count them down. She's a TV host, she's an author, she's a music artist herself, she's a philanthropist, she's a humanitarian, she's a painter, she's a wife, a mother, I mean there's not much she can't do, and she is Katie Cook. Hi! Katie, this is so awesome. We have been friends for a long time yeah. in this town. Um, so it, I would think it's fun to interview and talk to friends, even though we pretty much know each other pretty well. Um, that doesn't mean doing some research. I'm like, I didn't know you did that. Or how long has she been doing that? Or, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> Darren, you make me sound really, really yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are for that reason, for sure. Now, where most people would know you from, like we're talking about, is CMT. Yeah. You are... I would say you're the staple of that network. I've been there a long time. You've been there through all of the transitions and yeah. in and out um, of a hosting. How, many, how long have you been there, if you don't uh, mind me Well, asking? it was 16 years this past summer, yes. Yeah, so I'm going into my 17th year with that. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, I never dreamed in a million years. I would do anything for that long. Yeah, yeah. You even, back when I was doing a lot of starring and appearing in videos, you used to introduce a lot of videos I was in, everything That's from true. Alison Krauss to uh, John Michael Montgomery, all of those videos. How do you think music has changed? Because um, argumentatively so. I mean, you guys do the top Hot 20 countdown. Yes. Um, you and uh, Cody Allen, if you all know Cody. Yeah. Um, Cody. But there's, yeah, Cody's both, both <laughs> of our buddies. He's awesome. Um, music has evolved, videos have evolved. You know, for a while, played them all the time and then not so much yeah. and now they seem to they're all over the place obviously they're on CMT but a lot of artists on their Instagrams on their own social medias yeah. um, you know and I think we went through a transition where you would see some videos they didn't spend a lot of money on them yeah. but now they're spending a ton of money because they're back to like mini stories they are this is it's been very interesting to watch this over the years, and you've watched it just like I have. You know, years ago when people were still buying records, right? You know, the labels had huge budgets to spend on videos. It was almost unheard of for a video not to cost at least fifty grand, right? right. And then, you know, with all the illegal downloading, I hate to break uh, that kind of opens up a whole other can of worms. But all right. of a sudden, the budgets go way down because people sure. aren't selling records like they used to. And a lot of people, actually for a while there, we weren't even sure people were going to be going to concerts like they used to because everybody got addicted to their computer right, and right. their phone. And it didn't seem to be worth making really expensive videos anymore. And for a show like ours, it was a little scary for a while there because we weren't getting just th this ton of videos like mm. we used to have. And, and the video quality was going down. But... Now people are so used to having entertainment at their fingertips. It right. has become such a big way to promote artists again. I feel like now we're back on this lovely upswing where people are really taking videos seriously again. I the equipment agree, yeah. has gotten less expensive. There are people yeah. making their own. Independent artists are making incredible videos on their so cell true. phone. Right. And, and so um, in a way, I just feel like the quality is finally coming back up because there was a little dip for a while there. And and. Very often an artist would put a single out and wait for weeks and weeks to even see if they were going to even make a video. Right. Now we still run into that a little bit. I'll, I'll talk to an artist and they'll say, yeah, my next single's blah, blah, blah. And I'll be like, oh, well, tell me about the video. Yeah, yeah, we, we haven't gotten around to making that yet. And that used to be the opposite. You had well, a video sure. ready to roll when a single came out. Yes. Now people kind of let the single grow a little bit. So it's, it's ever changing, but thank God the video is still alive. Yeah, that's because a good... That's a huge Thing for oh, us, obviously, for sure, and that's that's a great point too. Is like back when I was appearing in as an actor and doing all those um, music videos, I remember we would get to the set and they would have to play the track a couple times because the track hadn't even been out yet. To your point, we would shoot the video first, and they would say, "So this is this is the song that's going to be coming out." Yes. So and a lot of times they go parallel, but that's that's a really yeah, good point. Yeah, they might even end up changing the song and have to go back and re-edit the video because they went back right. in and tweaked. It, right. it was really video first for years. Mm -hmm. That uh, we're not there, but at least the video is still alive because it's it's hugely important. So I, I always love asking people because a lot of people ask me this too, like your favorite person you've ever worked with. So who has been? And I think I might know this of already. Of course you know. Who is the best artist ever that you look forward because I know you 
I'm going to go ahead and say the pronoun. I know you've like interviewed her several times. Yes. And who, who might that be? Dolly. Of duh. course. Of course. <laughs> yeah, always hands down Dolly. And I, I'm, I'm really lucky that I just adore all the artists I interview. I, I really see people at their best. The, the 15, 20 minutes we have them on camera, they're always ready to go yeah. and they're in the best mood. So I feel like I always see the best side of everyone. But I don't even know if Dolly has a bad side. I mean, that woman is flawless 24-7. Yeah. She'd laugh if she heard us talk oh, yeah. about her this way. But yeah, she's absolutely the best. I always say my favorite thing about Dolly is I feel like I learn something every single time I'm with her about how to handle people, mm -hmm. about how to be professional, yeah. to be witty, quick. I mean, you know what she's like. Yeah. She's and even just as, just as a human, mm -hmm. she has those, those traits of just how to treat people in general. Yeah. And then especially, like you said, in the business, I had the privilege of working with her, like when I first rolled in town, I had a little extra role in a movie she was in. And she, like you said, the presence, she walked in on the set, just larger than life, yeah. and it made a joke. And yeah. I mean, and I mean, she said, literally, she said, y'all go ahead and look at them, I know they're there. <laughs> you know what I mean? So now we're gonna segue, what has been, uh, and you don't have to answer the name if you don't want to, but what's been maybe a situation or the most challenging kind of an interview that you've ever had to, to do. You know, not every artist likes to be interviewed, and right. you know this. It, that's always a challenge. You, you, you never want to start an interview finding out that they're running late, they're grumpy, they don't really want to be there. And but there are just, and I'm not going to name names because that right, would be right. rude. But there are a few that just really don't want to do it. They want to yeah. make their music, they want to put their records out, and they want to go tour. They, they're they're okay meeting fans, but this whole interview thing, they don't yeah. understand why they have to do it, and that's that's always unfortunate and it's a challenge and I try not to take it personally but it's hard because you know you, you do work doubly hard to get right. them to trust you and to be on your side a little bit and, and that's always disappointing yeah. I've had that happen a few times but I, I always have to walk away and go you know what, Katie it's really probably not you they probably never ever want to do interviews and right and a lot of I think at least a few instances those kind of artists are big selling artists so there's yeah. not they want to, and you know, I think in these, this situation, a lot of it, what you're trying to do is really for their fans, mm -hmm. because they're not that open as an artist, and you know, I imagine their fans are like, okay, Katie's going to interview so and so, I can't wait to hear what's going on, yeah. and then it's like, okay, well, thank you for stopping by. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, dog is barking. That's okay. Is that something oh, I should no. go ahead and take care of? No, or this is great. We are in the house, by the way. <laughs> She has a beautiful house. If you look at the things around us, that's the tip of the iceberg. So you're very, very gracious to be doing this interview in your house, and that's, that's just part of it. It's part of it. Hopefully not for long. <laughs> if okay. he doesn't pipe down, I will have to go up and say, what do I have to do? That's okay. We'll meet another cook in the family. <laughs> oh. um, so what do you love most about hosting? And we're going to get to the rest of it later on, because you do, like I said, open the show, a plethora of things. But what do you really love about hosting? Um, just being around people I look up to and, and being around music. I, I never really intended to be a TV host. You know, mm -hmm. my life was always music. And um, I kind of fell into the hosting thing in a really odd way. I mean, that, that, that's kind of a whole other story. I don't know if you want to go there or not. But what drew me to it was I would I get to meet Dolly Parton and Vince yeah. Gill and Allison Krauss. Yes. And, you know, like I just love those people so much. And I thought, well, gosh, I mean, yes, I think more like an artist than a journalist. I still struggle with that to this day, but I can, I can figure out how to be a journalist long enough to just get to sit in their presence and soak some of that right. up and, yeah. and learn. And um, that's always going to be the biggest draw. Like if, if I suddenly wasn't see, at CMT and I just got offered another TV gig, it might not be a good fit for me. I, you know, right, I right. didn't come into this just wanting to be on TV. It was really the complete opposite. So really the short answer is music. Yeah. For me, it's 100% music. I've only ever had one TV job, really, and it's been music-based the entire time. So would I make a good weather person or news anchor? I don't know. I mean, I can read a teleprompter, and I'm not sure. shy, and I don't sure. mind being on camera. I'd probably be okay. Well, that's what you can do the yeah. weather, but just sing it as it comes in. <laughs> Here comes a cold frog. <laughs> it's going to be blustery today. Yeah, exactly. yeah I, guess I could maybe do that. Be interesting. <laughs> what advice would you have for anybody who's starting out um, and looking to do hosting, whether it's on their own social media or more of a... Um, national presence based? Well, um, 
I would say don't wait. Don't like if, if you really love talking to people, if you really love doing interviews or, or presenting or whatever, just take every opportunity you can get, whether it's her, hosting an event at your church or emceeing right. a local charity gig, um, be the MC for somebody's birthday party. You know, oh, right, I don't right. know, just anything at all. Be the man on the street. You know, if you go with your friends to a you know, football game and you want to grab interviews with all your friends afterwards, just practice, practice, practice. Right. Just get on camera, build, build a little YouTube channel. Just don't wait. I mean, none of that social media even existed really when we oh, were getting sure. started. I mean, it was just starting. And um, I think now people really could be discovered that way. Um, right. and, and there's there's no reason not to get the practice. Don't just go find an agent and then sit back and hope that a major network is gonna right. just pluck you up. You know, right. get busy. Yeah. Really learn how to handle a situation when it goes completely off the rails. You know, do live stuff where all of a sudden your prompter dies or, you know, the band shows up 20 minutes late and you're up there doing a tap dance and trying to tell yes. funny jokes. You got to just do all that, <laughs> right? right? To, yeah. to be a host that somebody would trust. Yeah. I mean, hiring. it's an old cliche, but the show's got to go on, especially if it's live. If yeah. it's live, you you just got to roll with it. Exactly. So I, I just think anyone who wants to get started in this business, just don't wait. Yeah. Just do anything you can. Take, if it's just you and a cell phone, just get out there and start doing it and work your way up. But yes, eventually you probably need to land a good agent. Mm -hmm. An agent's going to say, show me what you got. And you right. want to be able to show them a reel. There's so much editing software out there now. There's no reason why somebody can't spend a year going to events, gathering interviews, putting a little reel together. Yes, maybe it won't have a superstar in there. But if you're great, if you've got a great personality and, and you have a good voice and you're articulate yeah. and you're quick-witted, you know, you could have a reel with no stars in it. Sure. But it could be what an agent would say. Yeah, All right. and really entertaining. And, yeah, and that's a good it. point you bring up is to really bring your personality into it as well. Yeah. Um, you know, and we'll, we'll circle, circle back to Dolly, and I think a lot of it, too, is uh, got to have humility, because that comes through your personality yep. um, and shines immensely. And, and even for you, I gotta, I'm going to give you a little plug. Um, gosh, this is probably years ago, maybe 10 years ago. I got, when CMT was, was switching through, you may not even remember this, but you were so incredibly cool to me at CMT Studios. I was pulled in to do a full interview, like makeup, audition, producers, and you had just finished taping something and came through, and I don't even know what the producer's name was, but you literally just walked by, stopped, turned around, saw me, gave me a hug, and you literally said, you need to hire him. <laughs> and I'm like, what she said? What she said? <laughs> oh, good. Okay, and good. I was like, I was like where's this really story going? What did oh, I do? No, I can't no. remember what I had for lunch yesterday, so there's no telling what this story is going to be. Oh, good. Okay. No, but I mean, that's... <laughs> well, they should have. Well, yeah. Well, and to my credit, they didn't hire anybody. They changed their mind, so... That happens a lot over there. <laughs> oh, well, they kind of, you know, and that's kind of the nature of the beast, too. Kind of, yeah. kind of what you were talking about is you just got to keep putting yourself out there and just keep doing it and exactly. doing it. Um, because there's going to be a door that opens eventually. And there's going to be so many people that give up and quit and get out of the yes. game. So just stay in it. Yeah. Stay in it. And, and I would say that this is advice I give to a lot of people. I guess I get, I get emails all the time from people that are just graduating college, they've studied journalism, and they you know, uh, really want to know what to do next. And I, I don't have all the answers, but one thing I say very much to girls is think about your voice. You know, um, there's, there's a trend right now. Well, you know, where it's like, oh my God, and that, or they're so blah, 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 everything is like that. And it's like, you got to think about it. If, if you want people, I'm not saying I have the greatest voice, but, you know, I try not to be a valley girl, and I try not to be right. that. And it's, it's just, just think about how you speak to people. Yes. And is, is it going to be crazy annoying for people to hear your voice for an hour at a time? <laughs> this know? is true. Think about it. This is true. This yeah. is true, for sure. You've and got a nice, smooth voice. And, and oh, well, thank you tailor-made for this kind of work. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, now, we did get to work together once, almost, I think, a decade ago at NBC on Nashville Star. Yes. Now, you were brought in, do I dare say, the last minute. <laughs> it um, was pretty last. It was after the first episode yes, aired. Yeah. yeah. Um, to start co-hosting with Billy Ray, yes. Billy Ray Cyrus. I was there as an actor as uh, John Rich's rehearsal double. Right. So I was there for the entire, the whole stint. Uh, that was really a 
fun experience. It was amazing to get to be on a major network like five minutes from my house. You know, yes. I was living in East Nashville at the time and yeah. shooting there at the whole Opryland complex. And man, that was a great opportunity. It was, it was a, a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Um, you know, live TV, yeah. pretty high pressure, but a great crew, great production. Oh, it really was. Yeah. And, you know, of course, Spot and 80 is Billy Ray's middle name, yes. so that, he always kept us laughing on set, for sure, for sure. I think I was brought in to be the one that would just read the pretty words on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> he and I joke about that now. Uh, but he was so he was so sweet. Yeah, he did the first episode by himself, and then they brought me in. He's like, I am so glad you're here. He's like, there are just so many numbers and things you got to <laughs> right, say. Right. He's, and he's like, if you can do half of that, I'm like, I got you, buddy. I totally got you. Right. So um, it allowed him to just relax a little bit more oh, yeah. and actually be a little more spontaneous. Right. You know, that exactly. was kind of my role to just anchor it, remind people how to vote and just, you know, be smart. Yeah, and that was, a good, that was a good pairing because you're right. He's very, even though he's got a teleprompter, he's very spontaneous. Uh, spontaneous. I'm going to make that up. Spon Cole, Cole spontaneous? Buster. Yeah. <laughs> Is that, is that the That's word? what I think of looking for, yes. He's very spontaneous, <laughs> and he's needed, dare I say, a little structure, which is what you provided. Yeah, and he'd be the first to say that. Yeah. Like I said, the, when I came in, he was just like, all right. <laughs> like, I can relax a bit. He wants to be the artist, you know, and he just right. wants to cut up and just take it wherever it wants yeah. to go, and I totally get that. Perfect segue. This is why we, we work well <laughs> together, two hosts. Speaking of artists, you and your husband are artists yourselves. Yes. And a group called Suncat. Yes. So let's let's dive into that. Tell me all about that. Because well, you've yeah. been singing for I didn't mean to interrupt. You've been singing for a long, long time. Yes. Yeah, so uh, yeah, long before I was doing the TV work, I had a deal with Curb and a publishing deal with EMI, and and I just assumed I'd be an artist for the rest of my right. life. And and everything was going pretty well for a while. I had a band called Reno, and and we put out an album, toured internationally, and. We almost cracked the top 40. We were getting pretty close okay. on pop radio. It was kind of a country pop mix. It would probably actually do really well today. But I mm. think at the time it was like, okay, you're trying to be pop or country. It was kind of a weird mix. And um, long story short, the band was having a lot of internal issues. And the band broke up. And so all of a sudden I was kind of left without a record deal. Well, no, with a record deal, but no income, no touring, nothing. You know, so. And you've got to have the support. Yeah, exactly. So it, I, I didn't know where I was going next. That's how I landed CMT. And really, I truly thought CMT will probably have me for like a year. I'll get to meet Dolly. I'll be happy. Yeah. And then I'll get right back to doing my music. Well, here I am, you know, going into my 17th year. Needless to say, CMT really took over my life in a beautiful way. Yeah. Then I became a mother. And, you know, I was always writing because you can't turn that off. If you're a writer, you're just going to, you know, yeah. still be... And, and it's not a cliche. I mean, it comes at any time. Oh, any time. Yeah, exactly. And so I was always writing my ideas down. I played ukulele. I've never been a great guitarist. But, you know, I would strum my guitar. I've got tapes and tapes. Well, now it's on my cell phone. Just tons and tons of songs. They were just building up, and I didn't know what to do with it. And basically, when Adam and I got together a few it's years your ago, husband, yeah. my husband now, um, he and I had known each other forever because he's, yeah, he's a know, musician in his own right. Yeah, yeah, he played with Big and Rich, and now he plays with Tim McGraw. He wrote a big number one for Faith Hill, Mississippi nice. Girl. Very proud of him. Great writer, producer, songwriter, and he's just been my buddy forever. Uh -huh. Well, we both got divorced around the same time and, you know, got chatting, literally on right? Facebook, okay. got chatting. And, um, and we're like, I always thought you were really awesome. So we went on our first date, fell in love, literally, like, love after the this. first date. It was crazy. So what happens when you put two writers together? And he's been just like me. He's always been working on his own solo uh -huh. stuff, but he's been so busy with Tim and Big and Rich and then his productions. And, um, basically, once we were hanging out together all the time, we the songwriting just sort of fell into, okay, well, now we're co-writing. I mean, it was really never an intentional yeah, thing. Just, just very seamlessly. Just kinda... Yeah, you're sitting around at night with a glass of wine, he picks up the mandolin, and you know, before you know it, you're writing together. Yeah. So... We quickly realized, I mean, I think it was like within two weeks, we had like five really great songs. We thought they were great, you know. And I think initially we were just still both in the mindset of, well, we'll try to pitch these because I'm too busy to be an artist, you're too busy to be an artist. Right. But then we were like, wait, this really kind of sounds unique. Like, And I actually love singing with you. Yeah. That's something I've struggled with my whole life. Okay. I love singing, but I don't blend with everybody. I've got a lot of vibrato. and. Mm -hmm. I don't know. There was something but about that, our I think that's blend. what makes an artist great. I mean, like your your idol, Dolly, very unique voice. Very unique. Which is, it's good to stand out. But I, I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah. Is, it's sometimes hard to blend. 
It really can be. Like Willie Nelson, everybody wants to sing a song with him, but right. you're better singing around Willie really right. than trying to sing with him. You yes. know. Um, and I had always felt like I, I just didn't blend with everyone. And, and there's something about, he's got a real kind of smoky, raspy voice. And I don't know, it just sounded good together. And so after a little talking about it, we're like, well, who says we can't do this? Sure. I mean, yes, we don't have time to get in a van and drive around the country and build up a following for years and years. We're not spring chickens anymore either. But it's like, we just need to do this for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so um, then he came up with the name. I call him Sonny. That's my nickname. Okay, and, okay. And Kat. Yeah, I was short, kind of wondering where. Short for Katie. Sure. Yeah, and we we just, we're both 70s babies, and we just kind of love that whole 70s vibe. We're huge Fleetwood Mac fans, Led Zeppelin, oh. and, and then, of course, 70s made, country. Yeah. I love old country. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, we came up with some cat, and we're like, well, let's just do it. Let's have no expectations. Let's do this purely because we need to get that artist side of ourselves right. out. Yeah. And it's it's going really well. I mean, we're just nice. really about to put music out, about to have our first full band gig. That's awesome. And we'll see. I mean, you know. Yeah. Just and we're doing got, it for the love of it. Something else a lot of people may not know is you've got this in your genes. I your, do. <laughs> your dad. <laughs> yeah. Your dad, um, Roger Cook, major songwriter. Yes. And the iconic, like to teach the world to sing, I know, I birthday know. harmony. Everybody knows I that love song. Your voice, Thank yeah, you. yeah, the Coca-Cola jingle. Because I remember, I mean, I didn't know that until only a few years ago. And then, I think it was an honor or something about the song or something. Anyway, I saw it on the internet. It was in a news blurb, and I'm right. like, that's Katie's dad. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, it's funny, my dad, I'm so proud of my dad, and I, I, I love talking about him, but I think he taught me kind of early on to just always have my own thing. Yeah. You know, he never really taught me to sing or how to play an instrument or how to write songs. He, he just was always thinking like an artist, was like, Katie, whatever you decide to do, it's just got to be your thing. And so um, I think a lot of people, I realize now a lot of people don't even know that he's my dad because I, I think I just always went through life yeah. like, I've got to find my own thing. I and can't that's, that's go around making that my calling card. That's right. easy. I'll have yeah. no street cred. But I am immensely proud of my dad. Yeah. You know, and, I, and every parent encourages their kid, but that's amazing advice and steadfast advice too because you, you've got to find your own way. Yeah. Um, you got to do your own thing. You got to do your own personality, like we talked about before. Um, and I got to tell y'all, walking around this house is amazing because you <laughs> are a really—I'm going to put all these adjectives—eclectically beautiful painter. Oh, thank you. You, <laughs> you have some really cool artwork. I love to paint. And have you been painting like most of your life, or is this? No, a... not at all. Um, my dad always encouraged. Both of my parents encouraged me when I was younger. If I was ever bored, they'd be like, "Well, pick up a pencil and a piece of paper." You doodle and stuff and um, I never really took any classes um, I there are limits to what I could do there I do get frustrated sometimes when I'm painting or drawing and I think oh, I can't get the shape of the face right and, you know I'm not a master by any uh -huh. any stretch of the imagination but I really like to I love a blank canvas and, and yeah. just turning it into something just like writing I think as long as I'm being creative I'm happy right I was gonna say this probably an extension of your songwriting creativeness it's yeah. just a different form of it because exactly. you can create a whole story on that blank canvas and then when it's done it's like that's a hit song right there yeah kind of well, like that's the whole story right there on the canvas and, the, and just the feeling of accomplishment when it's done when you step back and I, I don't know if this ever happens to you but like I know when I'm creating whether it's music or painting anything I very often step back and I'm like what just happened it's almost like I've channeled something yeah, you know yeah. I don't claim to be a channeler but but it is you do kind of go into a different place and I uh -huh. think you don't even always know that you're you're opening something up and, and right. inspiration comes through and I there are times I really do step back and I'm like I really don't even know where that just came from but I'm very proud of it and that happens a lot with painting for me that's now going this is all just you have all your talents mixed into one. It's like because you're walking through my brain. I, like, I kind of am. Squirrel. I kind of am. Yeah. <laughs> That's me. Squirrel. <laughs> totally. But you have a whole series of, of a children's book. Yes. I mean, Little Big Benny. Is, yes. Now, the first book you put out. I actually yep. put all three out together. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, but it's been a couple years though, right? Yeah, it was 2012 when I released them. Okay. Yeah, and I'm, I didn't know anything about the book world. I'm, frankly, I still don't. Um, so I basically wrote a very big book 
But then I was like, wait a minute, my target age group, this doesn't make sense. So I chopped it up into three books. And then I really didn't know anything about putting books out. And I didn't mm -hmm. have a publishing deal. And I thought, well, when I read a book, it's just like if I get hooked on a television show, I'm going to binge. You know, I don't want to wait <laughs> a year, you know, for a really good the next point. book to come yes. out. I, I'm just that way. Yeah. It's like if I hear there's a great buzz about a show, I'll let everybody else watch it. I'll wait a few years. If I'm really hearing great things about a show, I, I'll wait till I know they're done. Because then I'm going to want to go and watch it all in like a month, like, you know, seven seasons or whatever. I'm just, I'm kind of that way. And so I thought about it with the book. I thought, well... I could put one out and just wait and see, or I could just put it all out, and if, if a kid likes the first one, they can just go ahead and buy two and three. You oh, know, sure. There's no rules, right? Well, come to find out there's all kinds of rules in the book world, and <laughs> all kinds of things I probably did wrong, but I just had to put it out there, and I do find when a kid reads one book, they immediately call me and say, I want two and three, where do I get them? Um, so I think I've got a good book. I think, I think it could do no, well if I could yeah. figure out how to get it out into the world. There's yes. not enough hours in the day. So what is the, what is the uh, I mean, I know, but let's share it with everybody. What is the, the main character? What is the premise behind it? Yes, you? Little Big Benny, Benny Armstrong Jr. Uh, he's very, a little bit nerdy, a little bit of okay. a science geek, you know. Um, he's very curious about the world we live in, very curious about the cosmos. What he doesn't realize, um, you know, he, he feels very small in this vast universe. He doesn't know he is the universe. He has all these worlds that live within him. Love all, this. Love all these it. little characters. Yeah. They don't know they're part of him. They're curious about the universe, too. They have no idea they're within Benny. And, I mean, it could, that could go on for infin infinity. Right. I'm, I'm trying to just get kids to think macro, micro, you know, like, yes, in some ways I'm very small. In some ways I could be a giant. And there's all this cause and effect because... He, of course, just physically has an effect on these little beings. Uh, the flus of Lintopolis, they live in his belly button. And they're lovely little poofballs. And, you know, just something like a weekly bath is their mm -hmm. yearly typhoon and nearly washes away the entire town, you know. And they, they totally know that global warming must be real because the typhoons are getting more frequent. <laughs> right. Well, of course, he's just getting older and taking more baths. You know, it's all these kind of funny cause and effect things. But they, they sort of have a... A little bit of a mild effect on him too and he doesn't always know where that's coming from and uh, and then of course he's being monitored by aliens from outer space because you know we've got to put a whole other layer really on there right. and they're very naughty the aliens the Zetas Zugal and Zachney they're they just they're bored they don't like earthlings they don't get it they don't know why they're <laughs> on this assignment I don't get earthlings sometimes either <laughs> yeah they think Benny is just a horrible stinky little stupid boy and they don't get it and they don't know why he likes this ugly little girl Laura Lee who's not ugly she's precious um, they're utterly But in the alien's eyes, humans. she's like... Oh, she's disgusting. Yeah. She's another human. Right. Blah, you know. Um, so, but yeah. I think all the boys kind of thought girls like that when we were there. Like, ew, girls. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and Betty is just turning the corner. In my mind, he's between 10 and 12. I never really pinned an age on him. He's just kind of going from girls are gross to, ooh, why can't I stop thinking about Laura Lee? <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. I would definitely yeah. say at the time the idea first popped into my head, which was like 20 years ago now. Um, I was watching a lot of Simpsons. I grew up on the Muppets. Anything oh, that sure. Jim Henson did yeah. was huge to me, and Matt Groening, and um, Gary Larson, I think, wrote the Far Side, right? Is that Gary Larson? And, uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah Far Side so. Comics. I loved all that. So I was kind of coming at it with a lot of humor, and, and I initially thought this would make a great movie or TV show, um, but I thought, well, where do you start with that? I guess you sit and write a book. So it started right. with the books, and, and I'm still trying to find time to really promote them. And, but ultimately, my dream is to see them animated. Nice. Yeah. And I, what I love about about the storylines of these are, I mean, that was that's a whole bunch of information yeah. more than one, <laughs> but it's written where kids get it seamlessly. They get it, and it's it's an entertaining story, Thank and they're you. absorbing. I think they're absorbing. That's what I love about a good children's book. You absorb without really realizing you're absorbing. I hope if that makes so. Sense. Yeah, I definitely don't want it to go over anyone's head. I mean, I've tried really hard to have it make sense, you know, why you're all of a sudden back in the in the heart or in the belly button or in the ears, you know, the waxman yeah. in the caves fighting the mandos that live in the forest. Like, I I think there's always a reason. It always connects to something that's going on with Benny's day. And, and you know, did you ever watch Once Upon a Time? Oh, was, sure. Okay, one of my favorites. Yeah. You know, next thing you know, you're back in the enchanted forest, yeah. but, but you get it. And it, it somehow relates to what's going on in present day storybook. I had never seen that show when I wrote Little Benny, of course, I wrote it years and years ago, but when I first saw that show, I'm like, yes, 
this is how I would shoot little Benny because yeah. you can you can seamlessly go between worlds. I don't think that would be a problem at all. So hopefully kids are following it. I think they are. Yeah. Yes, I, I seem like I said I feel like every time I get a kid to read book one, next thing I know they've read two and three. So keep it up, kids. That's perfect. <laughs> now, did Daisy, your daughter? Yes. Does she inspire any of the writing in children's books or a character? Or? No. In fact, she's very furious with me. She oh, told me in she books wasn't? four, five, and six there better be a Daisy character. I'm like, okay. She was so little when I was really working on this. So. Um, no, I and I very purposefully actually left her out because I thought she'd get mad at me. You know, with kids, you can't win. If you leave it's them true. out, they're like, Mom, right. if you put them in, they're like, I'm so embarrassed. Yeah, you're like, well, why didn't my character have this or that? Or yeah, <laughs> totally. Could have made me a superhero. So I think I will somehow work her into the next one. I actually now, I've, I, now as a mother, I would write the books very differently. The next ones, there are definitely some things I will alter for the next ones. Because as a mother now, I'm like, well, I made his mother a little goofy. That ain't cool. She used to be a total rock star. You know, there's little right. things I want to tweak now. He needs a he needs a dog that was adopted. You know, like I, I just I'm thinking about it all differently now. But that's the beauty of writing. I can I can keep writing and keep right. shifting. And it. that's a really interesting point. Is as your own life evolves, mm -hmm. your creativity evolves, sure. um, and you have kids or different life experiences. Um, it's things, things manifest. Yeah. And. Create better songs, better stories, yeah, you um, see different the world angles. Very differently. You can have more sympathy for people that perhaps you didn't understand before. Right, for sure. Yeah. Now, you also, uh, there's a lot of great causes that are important to you, for sure. Um, like, especially adults living with IDD. Yes. Um, so, tell everybody what uh, IDD is. First yes, of all. well, it's intellectual developmental disability. Um, I I think when we were younger, you just say learning disabled or special right. needs. You know, right. the, 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 the terms are always shifting. The current mm -hmm. PC term is uh, an adult living with, or child living with an IDD. Um, it's a bit of a mouthful, but that, that's what it stands for. And um, I, my sister um, grew up with an IDD, uh, special needs. She, uh, there wasn't a label for my sister's disability is the best way to put it. Um, we do think she was somewhere on the autistic spectrum, um, maybe some cerebral palsy, we're not okay. entirely sure, but basically she was born with some brain damage and it was never really that well diagnosed and th there was yeah. no magic group for her to right. be part of. There was no uh, parental group for my parents to get support. I mean, you know, she was born in the 60s in England and times have changed a lot. There's a lot more yeah. support now for parents and, and families living through this, but Joanne's biggest goal in life really was to live independently. She also wanted a job, and she also wanted to find love. That was her three things that she wanted, and there, we still have a very, very long way to go, but there are yeah. groups like Our Place Nashville mm -hmm. that are trying to help adults living with IDDs to learn how to live independently, to be in a safe community um, with more neurotypical adults as right. well on the premises. and. Um, I really, really think we we need <laughs> millions more of these places, and we needed them last year. It's yeah. like this can't happen fast enough. There should be a housing development on every corner because the need is just growing exponentially. Yeah. The and amount of people being diagnosed with autism, right. I, it's we can't even imagine what we're going to be dealing with. Yeah, and you know, and you're right. We've come a long way, yeah. but we haven't come nearly far enough. Yeah. Because growing up. Because, uh, like you, I'm a child of the 70s, and I grew up in a really small town, um, small community in Iowa, and I had a really good friend in my class, and and probably you could relate to your sister, they're really, especially back then, really misunderstood. Yes. Like my friend, everybody thought he was just purposely being a jerk and mm -hmm. acting out, and, and then so, in school especially, they would treat it as such, mm -hmm. and it was really the wrong, which only really, in, I'm saying period, that's not the right word. It, would, it just really, well, it, it wasn't beneficial to him yes. because it was, there was the wrong communication going on and they didn't understand for the longest time. Um, I think they, like he had attention deficit disorder or something yeah. along those lines. Yeah. Um, and it's, you're right, we, for sure, we need to step that up. Well, we do because also it's very frightening for a parent 
who yeah. has a child living with an IBD to know how to set them up for life because that parent knows I'm not going to be here forever. Right. Who is going to look out for my child? I mean, even if you have the money to leave them an enormous trust fund, which is, is great, but you still don't know who's going to be really, truly looking out for them. Right. And it breaks my heart when I see just our homeless population. You know, it's it's not always a, a vet dealing with PTSD. Sometimes it's somebody with a learning disability whose right. family didn't know how to support them or whose family died and couldn't leave them the resources. Yes. And there are, I mean, we, we're only just beginning to scratch the surface of understanding disability and, and mental health and, and brain damage. It's, it's a hugely complex issue. And the, the best thing we can do, one of the best things we can do is find stable, safe housing and life skills to ease the worry on the parents. Yeah. You know, because not everybody has a giant family where somebody can just be moved around aunts and uncles and True. cousins. Not everybody has siblings. And um, it, it's just a huge need. So I'm, I'm just gonna continue to <laughs> shout about it and try to raise money and do what I can. And we're working on some projects now that will hopefully aid in that. That's, that's awesome, yeah. that's awesome. Now- Thank you for bringing it up. Oh my gosh, for sure. Now something that's both really near to our uh, together our hearts as well is we love animals. Yes. <laughs> love animals. Um, and so that's another thing that you are a big advocate for is yes. uh, especially homeless animals. Yes. Yeah. That's always been a big passion. I don't understand why we have so many homeless animals in our country, anywhere in the world. There's no reason for it. Yeah. I mean, almost every family wants to have a pet. So right. where's the disconnect? Yeah. You know, spay and neuter your animals, please. And Adopt, don't shock. It's really simple. Um, I like that. I've never you can heard that be before. I picky. Like that. I mean, you know, if you if it takes you two years to find your dream dog, mm -hmm. you know, or the one that doesn't make you sneeze, whatever, you know. But take the time, and mm -hmm. and if you insist on having a puppy so you can train them, that's fine. The shelters are full of puppies too. Oh, for sure. Thank God there are people that are willing to adopt senior dogs. Yes. You know, or for dogs that need more medical care. Sure. I mean, okay, so. We're going to do what I call Darren's Fast Five. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so these are, and it's not really that fast, but it's like um, this or that scenario. Okay. Um, and coming to your house, I know the first one already, but I'm going to ask you anyway. <laughs> okay. Dogs or cats, obviously. <laughs> no, both. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I really, I truly can't pick. I, you, my cat's hiding right now. I don't know why. Oh. I'm surprised she's not sitting in your lap, Jupiter. I freaking adore cats just as much as dogs. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't think I can pick. Okay, fair enough. Well, let me ask you, what is it about both animals, both traits of uh, both animals that are, are dear to you? Yeah, well, a dog, it's the unconditional love. It's mm -hmm. somebody that you know will always be happy to see you when you come home, even if they drive you a little crazy. Right. You know, they, they just really help you never be lonely, which right. is like buddies, you know? They give me an excuse to get out and walk and all of that. But my cat is just a snuggle bug. I mean, uh, I mean, cats, you know, the whole world revolves around them. <laughs> right, I mean, right. You know, she, she does actually perk up when she sees me, but she's also kind of like, oh, back at home. Yeah, right. You know, she doesn't do the big crazy waggy tail jumping yeah. on me. But the way we snuggle, she's a real snuggle bug. And um, I love playing with cats. It's simple, you okay. know, with a dog, you're, you know, you're throwing the toy uh -huh. and they bring it back and everything. But the cat getting her on her back and she's, and she's just kicking with her little bunny <laughs> rabbit legs. And it's just a different kind of playtime. And I love them both. And she just sits in my lap when I work. When I'm at the computer, she is just my little warm. Oh, I love that. on my lap. I just am very attached to her. Yeah, I love that. So like when you bought the house, you didn't realize this was her house and you were just inhabiting That's it. That's exactly. In her <laughs> mind, that is 100% what's going on. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Salad or pizza? Salad. Okay. Yeah. Has well, it always I, been that way or is it? I love pizza. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> okay. Ideally, I would have the salad and the pizza. Um, but um, truly desert island food for me would be roughage. Oh, the okay. The fruits and the vegetables. I've been vegetarian for over 30 years and I'm uh, about 80% vegan. I, I'm, you know, hats off to true vegans that absolutely monitor everything all the time. <laughs> I don't, but I really crave my veggies. Yeah, I mean, I, I do love a great salad. Yeah. I love. Uh, honestly, like, if I eat a piece, I did, I cut you off. I'm sorry. No, you're no fine. If I, if I eat a piece of pizza, it's going to taste great. I'm going to feel a bit funky. Yeah. I, I want to feel good all the time. So yeah. yeah. Good point. Good point. Now, would you rather go see the movie or read the book? These days with my schedule, I'm, I'm just likely to go see the movie. But I love to read. 
but yeah, but my days have been so busy that sometimes a book is sitting on my nightstand for like six months. Yeah. Because I, I get about five pages in and I'm like, oh. <laughs> 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 it's just happening. My personal favorite, wine or whiskey? Wine. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, then red or white? Red. Okay. I got no time for the white. <laughs> gotta be red. Like, just heavy red wine. Even in the middle of the summer. I could be sitting on a hot beach, and I'm like, big okay. glass of red wine. I love red wine all year long. I'm not all one right of those on. people. It's not seasonal for me. Okay. White wine gives me a headache, and most people are the opposite. Most people say red wine gives them a headache. Yeah. Nope, I could, I could drink it for breakfast. <laughs> So are you a Cav, a Merlot, and Noir? Um, it, well, actually, that will depend. Okay. I do a little more Merlot in the winter. I can kind of do yeah, Cav anytime. I do like Cav anytime. I do find in the summer I might go more Pinot Noir. Yeah. Right on. My favorite is like a Spanish Rioja. Okay. Or as they say in England, Rioja. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Tempranillo. I okay. like that. So like I said at the top of the show, I love doing these because you learn things about your friends. I, for some reason, I don't know, I thought you were going to be a Christian. The whiskey girl. Uh, yeah, I don't, you know what? <laughs> On special occasion, maybe? <laughs> no. Oh, no, ever. Because when I was a kid, my dad loves whiskey. Okay. And all of his friends love whiskey. Oh, I get you. Gotcha. And I just always remember dudes smelling like whiskey. It's ah. almost like, I tried to write a bad country song once about like, <laughs> like I, when I finally grew up, I realized whiskey wasn't the smell of your cologne or something. I was trying to work that into a line because it seemed like a really bad, sad country song. Um, but I, to this day, associate the smell of whiskey with just, just guys getting sloppy and keeping me up at night because they won't shut up and I'm trying to go to bed. Gotcha. Kind of like the old uh, Bonanza or gun smoke <laughs> bar. You walk in, everybody's shooting whiskey. Well, and, and, and because there was so much cigarette smoke yeah. when we were kids growing up. And the, the smell of the whiskey and the cigarettes and the sour beer. I'm not a beer drinker either. And I think, I don't have any traumatic memory. You know, yeah, nobody right, right. beat me up at a bar when I was a kid. <laughs> but I think it just smells, it smells like kind of just funky old man to me. I've just offended half of the universe. I apologize. <laughs> Um, whereas nobody drank wine in my house ever growing okay. up, so when I discovered wine, it was something very exotic and different, and it was mine. Yeah. See, I wouldn't be able to. <laughs> I got to be honest. I don't know if I could answer that because I'm both. Really? Yeah. I am a. I'm a. I'm a Jack Daniel Squire. I like whiskey so okay, much. Okay. Right. But like you, wow. I love a great red. Yeah. I really love a great red. Um, and I didn't used to like wine at all. Really. And, and then it's. Uh, there's so much about it. It's. Yeah. Oh, we could have our own show on wine. <laughs> I know. I kind of want to go get a glass right now. Um, I mean, Hoda and Kathy Lee do it. We could. I know, totally. right? <laughs> oh, we could, oh, totally. Oh, that would be good. So music-wise, um, what are you a bigger fan of, rock or country? Now, I don't want to offend your CMT fans. No, 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 not at all. I, I hate to say both to everything you ask me. Um, I probably listen... And it could be a combination of... Yeah, I listen to more country probably when I'm driving. Okay. Um, but I... Heavy rock. I mean, I like Black Sabbath and Zeppelin, nice. and yeah, I really. You love heard it here first. <laughs> heavy rock from I Stevie like, Cook. I like heavy rock. I like. I mean, yeah. I it, that would be hard to pick. Maybe there's not a whole lot of in between for me. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of like extremes in everything. I kind of do too, but I love that because I think. You know, these are just fun questions, but I do think that we're all built and made up of many different elements yeah you know and we're influenced by many different sounds and stories and songs and well yeah and you know the weird thing is like it makes me feel the same it's not like I have to be in a mood for heavy rock or I mean literally I if I'm on an airplane you know listening to my iTunes I mean it's Alison Krauss could very easily be followed up by Black Sabbath and I'm gonna get the same feeling from both mm -hmm. it's it's melodies and, and, and instrumentation and dynamics and I'm getting all geeky now, but it, it, if that makes sense, I, I've just got to feel it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have to be in a mood for one or the other. It's, it can all just be okay, all the so time. Okay, so that that really is prolific. That's that makes perfect sense, and I mean that really does. Um, and I love going from Alison Krauss to Black Sabbath. I love that. that. To me, they're the same. If that makes any sense. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I would never looked at it that way. But when you talk about it, it totally does. It the makes feelings sense. I get, the images it conjures yeah. up, and yeah. So what's up? What's on the horizon? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, first full band gig for Suncat. That's going to be on October second at the basement. I'm very excited about that. Um, and uh, hopefully a 
lot more painting this year. I'm trying to really make time for that again. Still trying to promote Little Benny all the time. You know, oh, and by the um, way, we forgot to plug that. It's all over Amazon. Oh, so yeah. So <laughs> look for it on Amazon. Yeah, or you could go to littlebenny.com. Oh, the light just went out. Oh, live TV. Yeah, we're, not, we're well, we're not live, but <laughs> the little light just went out. But you can still see us. You can still see us, I hope. <laughs> and then CMT is keeping me hopping. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, gosh, you know, CMAs are coming up and Grammys in January and... Um, you know, Hot 20 every single week, and I go somewhere almost every single week. Uh, almost all of my you, interviews are done in another You and Cody state. are all over the place. All over the place, all the time, and I love it. I mean, I, I'm used to, you know, traveling, and that's just part of what I do. I get really antsy if I sit around for yeah, too, too long. I, I too. I too. Now, where can everybody find you on social media? Oh, yeah, so I'm the Katie Cook. You know, that's the thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was another Katie Cook already. So uh, the Katie Cook on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and, yeah, littlebenny.com for the books. And, cool. and, and uh, Suncat. Suncat, right. Yeah, you at guys are Suncat on Instagram Official. And, okay. Yeah, Suncat Official, and it's cat with a K, like Katie. Suncat. Love it. Um, so thank you. Well, thank Darren, you. This, this has been awesome. Awesome. I've really enjoyed talking this to you. This is Katie Cook, guys. You are watching Meet the Host. I'm Darren Otto, and remember, one voice can make a difference, so dare to dream, and we'll see you next time.